over to you, Alex, and um, um, forward to the talk. Thank you. And thank you all for, for coming. It's um, uh, it's a really nice opportunity to to exhibit the work here and, and you know, be uh, involved with the uh, CAS for many years. So it's, it's sort of uh, feels like a nice supportive family of people. Um, so, Working. On the 19th of June, 1878, in Palo Alto, California, English photographer Edward Muybridge successfully captured a historic series of 12 photos of a racing horse galloping at full speed. It changed our perceptions forever. Up until this moment, most artists painted horses at a trot, with one foot always on the ground. And at a full gallop, the front legs extended forward and the hind legs extended to the rear. This was called the flying gallop. The human eye could not fully break down the action of the quick gates of the trot and gallop, and the average camera exposure time in 1872 was much slower, about two seconds. It was literally somebody taking the lens cap off, popping it back on. And Moybridge worked on the project <clears> for six <throat> years, during which time he was controversially, controversially avoided being convicted for murder when he shot and killed a man who he discovered was having an affair with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he did devise a system of mechanical shutters made of wood, rubber, springs, and a trigger that would snap close within one thousandth of a second. His technological system proved, once and for all, that indeed a horse does take all of its feet off the ground and proving the theory of unsupported transit and consigning the practice of depicting the flying gallop history. Don't worry, I'm not reading the whole thing. It's just like that to get, it's hard to get these details right. Uh, so this story has deeply resonated with me uh, ever since I first heard it, one of the things you made. As an artist, I've been driven by how we can use emerging technology to enhance our sensory experience of the world far beyond our physical abilities. This focus has enabled me to cross over into the field of art science, where instruments have been built to let us see further, faster, and smaller than ever before. Past classical physics into the quantum realm as I'm experiencing firsthand with my current fellowship at the University of Surrey, where I'm artistically responding to the emerging science of quantum biology. It has been suggested to me several times over the years that the techniques in this process that I am about to describe to you could themselves be useful for study and research. As with Moybridge, the study of the running horse was instigated by the desire for knowledge about the mechanics of how horses move and not for aesthetic purposes. However, I am inexorably drawn towards an aesthetic experiential methodology. Technology reveals the deeper workings of existence to us, but also extends our physical form and abilities into the world, enhancing and affecting our experience of being alive. Having said that, I did find this photo I took in Malta that inadvertently highlights the infestation of hornets that is putting the native honey production on the threat. A little close up of this, uh, you can see the hornets, they're, they're kind of everywhere all over the, uh, again, I'll explain it's like five minutes and uh, exposure. So while we strive to divide up existence into smaller and smaller parts, our physical being cries out for a human scale experience to have some innate understanding of our body and mind in relationship to each other and to the universe, to marvel at the interplay of movement of ourselves and everything that surrounds us, dancing through time forever. French sculptor Auguste Rodin said about Moybridge's instantaneous photography that it is the artist who is truthful and it is the photograph that lies. For in reality, time does not stop. I can tell this down and tell you what is algorithmic photography. 
so this is an example. Uh, one of the pieces that, that's uh, in, the, in the show. Uh, and this is Brighton Pier. Uh, here, and this, I live in Brighton, this is Brighton Beach, and these are sort of seagulls uh, hovering over unsuspecting tourists uh, looking to steal their chips. <laughs> um, now, time lapse photography is obviously nothing new. I'm sure you have seen uh, many images of you know, traffic at night and stars. And the reason why these images uh, kind of exist is because uh, film and camera sensors are light sensitive. They, they're just receiving the light from the world. Uh, and if you open up the camera lens, uh, the shutter rather, and just let the light pour in, you will record the light over a period of time. Normal photographs are obviously very, very short lived. Uh, but at night, you, it's, where it's dark, you can have these uh, trails of uh, points of light. Uh, this can be used very artistically. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's range from a sort of cool, uh, kind of, you know, the, the effect of motion blur on, on photos. Uh, now, this is not a controllable uh, side, uh, you know, part of the thing. I mean, you can you can limit the shutter speed, but that's it. That's that's all you can do in terms of deciding how much light gets, uh, you know, how long an exposure you're going to take. Uh, so this is where sort of algorithmic photography comes in. <laughs> Using an algorithm, or many algorithms now that I've, I've developed, it allows you to decide per pixel of the image uh, what parts of the <laughs> image come through and what, what parts don't. So for instance, this is one of the stills uh, images from the picture that I showed you previously, uh, that exposure is made up of a five minute video, which is 7,500 frames like this. And for each frame I go through and I decide which pixel goes through, which doesn't, how do they get mixed together? I will go into more detail uh, about the process in a minute. So uh, hopefully you can sort of see the, the relationship between the uh, the two images. So fundamentally, that is the process. Now, this is something I've been working on for the past eight years, I think, uh, in terms of actually producing these kind of images, uh, developing new algorithms, new techniques, new using different hardware, and uh, again, I'll talk about that in a second. But I did want to, in the, in the spirit of um, Kaz, uh, I wanted to talk about the inspiration for the process, and and I promise this isn't like a, a sort of life story. Although although you, you might like when the start you'd be like oh god, um, but it's I wanted to draw a direct line through the experiences that have taken me to produce this work, uh, and I think you know it's I forget. I think it will make the work sort of uh, clear in terms of its um, intention. So we'll start. And this is what I mean. Like my very first uh, thing that I remember ever was King Kong, black and white film, 1933, uh, on a small black and white TV set in a flat in London. That is my, that is my, you know, I, I must have been like two or three or something. It was like, it was like the first thing I ever remember. And Willis O'Brien was the, uh, the guy behind the animation, the stop motion animation. And I really got into stop motion animation and, and really loved the whole uh, way that it was it was uh, sort of done because it was it was breaking down time. It was breaking down motion. It was breaking down our understanding and going from a kind of Moybridge uh, thing you know where we're breaking the world down into this understanding uh, through time and then showing our understanding by putting it into uh, practice by by creating these effects. Uh, Ray Harryhausen was was works on <laughs> Mighty Joe Young with Willis O'Brien, I think, on, on the, and became one of the you know the greats of uh, this kind of model animation. I'm sure you recognise some of these. Uh, things from Clash of the Titans and Jason and the Argument. 
Um, and I, I really sort of followed in this in this footstep. I got a Super 8 cab film camera. Uh, and I and I met him. I went to, he was in Brighton in 1987 uh, at this science fiction convention. And I went to go and meet him. And I was like, hey, I'm doing all this stuff. And he, and he had this incredibly wonderful deep voice. And he just said, stick with it, kid. <laughs> <laughs> And, and for some years, I felt like I'd sort of failed him, but now I should, you know, it's, it's just sort of I'm from a different route. But um, um, you know, at the same sort of time, there all these sort of special effects, like like you know, this golden age of of manual models and, and creating these sort of special effects, which obviously goes back to you know George Melier and and you know all that kind of uh, false perspective and all these these kind of amazing tricks. Um, there was actually this this other contemporary of Moybridge, who I, I didn't know about at the time, but I, I've actually only found out about uh, fairly recently, but I really wanted to mention him because uh, the images that he produces are far more like my images, but this was back in 1882. Uh, he's a French scientist uh, called um, uh, Etienne Jules Marie, and he was uh, a yeah, French scientist and physiologist, and he developed a technique of taking photographs on the same print. Uh, for some reason, he thought a gun shape would be a really good idea for a camera. <laughs> so this is a this is his. Um, he, he, de he developed a, a thing called chronophotography. Uh, in the 1880s, which is really parallel to, to Moybridge's work. Um, and this is a chronophotographic gun that he made in 1882. It was able to take 12 consecutive frames. Um, I don't know, you shouldn't really take that out of London these days. You know, <laughs> that would not be, uh, not be completely acceptable. Um, obviously, these both of these people uh, Influenced people like um, Marcel Duchamp, Francis Bacon did uh, projects directly referencing Moybridge. Uh, you know, I was really into cubism, the breaking of the the point of view of the observer, mm -hmm. uh, and also time and how time is uh, represented. Uh, you know, had a had a great interest in in abstract and and experimental films, so particularly measures of the afternoon. Uh, by Mayor Darren, Unishia and Andalou by Louis Bunuel. Uh, especially this scene with the, the guy dragging the, the piano in with the, um, I think that's Dali actually attacking the <coughs> piano and being dragged in, uh, which is a sort of early, I think a sort of early form of video sculpture, which is another thing that I'm, I'm interested in. Uh, again, with, with film directors, Chris Lang, uh, Andrei Tarkovsky and, and David Lynch, they play with time, they play with perception, and they play with, uh, you know, sort of the long shot, especially um, Tarkovsky, you know, does these incredibly long uh, shots, which, which I found sort of very inspiring. Uh, but none more than Paulina Scutti, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, music by Philip Glass, uh, Ron Fricker was the uh, director of photography. Uh, it's it looks a little dated in parts now, but you know, as, as a as a sort of testament to uh, you know, the tour de force of of a vision, uh, it, it still really stands out. It's it's completely it's without any narrative or spoken narrative, but there is a narrative about how life is out of balance. Uh, it's speaking these incredibly sort of speeded up time lapse shots of people driving around and. Uh, again, it was you know Sam. I think we've we've watched that a few times. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was it was uh, very uh, influential for me. And of course, I, I could not avoid uh, mentioning uh, Clive Sinclair and the invention of the ZX eighty one, which was my first uh, computer, um, and and really derailed my interests in pretty much everything else so like like all the, all the super eight stuff all the you know all this was, was pretty much um, just went on uh on computer teaching myself programming 
and I met Clive Sinclair. Um, and, I, and I had a couple of glasses of wine, so I, was, I got the courage to sort of go up and introduce myself. And I just said, I just really wanted to say uh, thank you because you really, you know, affected my the course of my whole career. Uh, I will tell you what he said, but a bit later. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's all relevant. So, um, I went back to Moy Bridge. This is this is a book that I had, uh, and this was a series he did about this sort of running man. Um, and I scanned the first time I ever got a scanner, which was I was working. It was like 1989. I had a Commodore Amiga uh, and a Gen Lock and all this sort of stuff. And I scanned this image at like you know, 640, 480, or cut them all up, reanimated them in the first fully digital work that I ever created, uh, which was actually for my A-level uh, project. And I did this sort of six-minute tour de force of just every technique I could do and they absolutely hated it. And, uh, <laughs> almost, almost put me off computers and everything. Um, well, I did write a book. This is uh, a book on uh, the Dawning Genius, the Essential Computers, Digital Photography, uh, in two thousand. Um, available on Amazon now for twenty three pounds. Uh, I did see it for sixty five p at one point. So, I think it's, <laughs> so. Uh, anyway, so. You know, this this is not a, a short thing that I've been doing, like my interest in photography, my interest in digital, uh, and the combination of the two. So how this sort of manifested itself was in the sort of early 2000s, I had learned about the VJ scene, the, you know, the, uh, you know, doing live visuals uh, with music in club situations. Uh, and I thought, it's great, I can, I can program effects at home during the day and go to the club in the evening and perform in front of an audience. Uh, and mm. this work. Yeah, so this was, this was uh, one called Fug Feedback. Um, it was basically a video feedback plug. So this is the source video that's been plugged into it and then you know, different kind of effects that you could do. Uh, with it. So this was all real time. This was, I think it was running at like 320, 240. This was like before GPUs. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you could go to a club and you could do the stuff and you could go all sort of trippy and uh, uh, zooming stuff. And you've got like, uh, like you can see the background is being replaced. You can sort of zoom the effect. But you can see that I'm starting to play with uh, extracting and creating a time-based interpretation of it. And this, this is still used. This is, you, know, you still get emails about this you know, 20 years later. For, you know, it's, it's a favourite effect. And, you know, uh, so I think, I think it's still in use. Um, I was a big fan and, and still am of the OpenCV library, uh, which is an uh, incredible programming library of, of lots of computer vision uh algorithms which fortunately i didn't have to implement myself because uh, that would take way too long but um i wanted to give it a mention because it was it was really sort of instrumental in opening my eyes about what uh, algorithms were available and what what i could uh, sort of use at my disposal um and then there was this project called statues also die uh, which was inspired by a chris marker film of the same name and this was 2008. That? that was uh, Martin A. Smith, a very, very lovely uh, sound artist who I worked with on this, on this project. Uh, and we did a series of Video installation, video mapped installations along the Chelsea Embankment, projecting statues. And this was a screen based piece, and he wrote a soundtrack for each one. I did it here. Um, but the idea was, was I'd seen this film, and it was, a, it was uh, about colonialization in uh, French. Uh, yeah, it's terrible. 
But then it was the idea that, that statues, not looking at statues, they die. If you, if you walk to work every day and you walk past the same statue and you stop looking at that statue, it stops having any, any meaning. Relevance, specifically. Yes. And, and it, it has no, you know, it doesn't jump out of So the idea was that we were projecting on statues and bringing them back to life. Uh, but in this installation, and I apologise for the for the terrible state of my uh, video documentation. Um, I'm at it now. But, uh, but basically, you would stand in front of the screen and you would have to stay still. And if you stood still, your ghostly appearance would appear on the screen. You had to be the statue. Uh, and then you could walk off and your statue would remain. And it was basically over the course of your stand in front of it and, uh, and this was like a busy road it was just there so again lots of removing the background you know trying to pick out uh what pixels we we were interested in and what uh you know for the final result uh and this this process just continued uh this was the, the original demo of, of um uh, using this so again, this was all live video feeds. This is all, all done. Just to this, but basically, it's the point of the camera out the, the window because it was just testing with a really complex uh, kind of scene. But you can start to see the, the trails, the colors. So, you know, I was sort of on this path. I'm sort of interested in. Uh, I did this other more refined version of statues also die called Shadows of Light, uh, which was a Connect-based um, 3D um, interactive installation where, where you could stand in front of it. It would recognize you're standing there and your silhouette would appear projected in a color. But if the longer you stood there, it was like you were a stencil and somebody was using spray paint. So all the paint started to <laughs> drip. Uh, and again, it was the idea of rewarding people for standing still. It was it was playing on the idea that, that you know, if you uh, like like in the at the time in the Louvre, they measured how long people looked a piece of art, and it's like four seconds or something. So I, I, I sort of playing like you had to look at this artwork for quite a while, but to really uh, get the most out of it. Um, uh, and that might be in the Tate tanks. Proud of that one, but. Um, it was shown there. Um, and this is the first algorithmic photography or photograph. This is again using a live camera. It's out the window of Vanna's studio. Uh, not particularly salubrious uh, <laughs> uh, environment. But that was kind of, this, this really appealed to me. Like, like I didn't really know what was going to happen. Uh, you can see that all of these, the colours are people, people uh, So, you know, if they were wearing, it was a nice sort of sunny day, and if they were wearing a nice bright colour, uh, it would face them. And, and I didn't know that it was going to kind of turn out so, so beautifully, like, like, like kind of distinct, and you could see this one, certainly very abstracted, but you, know, you could sort of see this river of colour that, that people had sort of made. Um, this was 2015, and this was like, oh yeah, this is this is great. I'm going to do this now. Uh, this is a really good technique. So, also coupled with the fact that that we, you know, myself and Anna, we travel a lot um, for artwork, art installations, and residencies or whatever. Um, and I like, I get really itchy if I can't do some something creative, you know. So. The idea of sort of traveling with a very small camera and being able to go around the world and wherever you are, just like take photos and, you know, was was a way of, um, of sort of being able to create something uh, wherever I was, you know, in, in the world. So this, this is a path that, um, that yeah. I've taken. So I'm going to try and sort of explain how it works without getting hideously uh, complicated. Uh, because, you know, we haven't even had any wine yet, so. <laughs> um, so this this is uh, one of the cameras that I used. Very, very small, little GoPro 6, I think this is. Um, 
I was using like an earlier GoPro initially, and I've I've since upgraded to uh, DJI Action Four. But again, it's like every time I do, you know, you get a bump in quality, you get a bump in uh, resolution, and all the rest of it. But they're all very very small. They're waterproof. They can just go in your pocket. They're very scratch resistant. All of it. Uh, so this is a rare candid shot um, of me uh, with my little carbon fiber uh, tripod and my, my tiny little camera like on the end there. Uh, this is in Tashkent in Uzbekistan. So so it's really like, you know, the kind of thing I can just put on my back and just carry around and, and do it. Um, and that was like a really core cool part of the, the thing. I mean, yes, I, I could use 8K cameras, 16K cameras, there are, you know, many multi-pixel cameras, but they're big. And part of this was was to have this ability to just react to a situation. Um, so the sort of technical aspect, just to give you an idea of the amount of data that's, that flows through one of these images, uh, I aim for about five minutes of filming, although it's not a sort of um, not you know uh, raw, but it's it's one of kind of stuck to uh, roughly about twenty five frames per second, depending on the uh, the subject. Uh, so that equals seven thousand five hundred frames. Uh, could either be at HD resolution, ten thousand nine hundred twenty five to eighty pixels. Uh, although now I'm with like four K images, so uh, you know four times the resolution. Uh, so that's two million pixels for HD. 8 million pixels per frame, uh, 7,500 frames. This is obviously a lot of data. Each pixel is uh, you know, made up of a component of uh, like how we describe that color. So traditionally, it's like RGB. You know, we've got a red, green, and blue. And we have different levels uh, to make up a particular color. But actually, when you start looking into it and you look into how computers represent color or how we use computers to represent color, it gets horrifically complicated. I wouldn't recommend it. I spent like two months, like, like, you know, starting to, okay, well, we're going to cube saturation and lumens. That's, that's pretty easy. You know. we'll, we'll start with our RGB cube. We'll go to Q value saturation. This Q saturation value, and there's different shapes you can do. And then we go into like different color spaces. And this is, you know, these are like all the colors that we can perceive. And then each of these kind of frames is one algorithm's ability to represent the total number of colors. So, you know, you've got sRGB, you've got Adobe RGB, you know, you can see that they're, you know, very, very different. Um, I don't think we've even got RGB on this, but it's like a, like a smaller um, sort of frame. So how you store the data is, uh, you know, different depending on what algorithm you use or what, what format you use. You can use 8-bit, you can use 16-bit, 32-bit uh, component. Um, even, I was going to say, even grayscale, you think, oh, we just convert a, a color to... To gray, that's easy, isn't it? You just you just go to Photoshop, you just grayscale. No, there are there are hundreds of ways to go for grayscale. Uh, you could just take red, or you just take luminance, or you can or you can go to CMYK and mess about with those, and you can or you can use the the oh I don't, I don't, you get the idea. Go on, go on the Wikipedia page; it immediately dissolves into like equations. And, uh, anyway, I I researched all this, and I I sort of implemented a lot of this inside the software. Now I promise this is the only little bit of code I'm going to show you for this. Uh, this is kind of the idea that you sort of go through each pixel and you, you have a couple of zinks and you say right we're going to go you know from start at the top left and we're going to work through and go, go down to the bottom right. This is incredibly slow. You remember we're talking about like a 4k image, 7,500 of them this takes so long. So in order to make it usable and make it reactive, um, I had to go for a sort of OpenGL shader route. So this is using the parallel processing of GPUs. Uh, this is an early prototype 
in my software 3 gs It's actually a really early version of it, which is looks very different. So each of these is like a, a shader and you've got all the sort of things being fed into each other. So it's a multi-stage shader process. It's like four different stages and lots of different buffers. And again, I've, I've, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting too deep already. But anyway, this is what the software looks like. This is a very ugly bit of software because I don't share it. Uh, but this is um, the current iteration of it. It's a third or fourth version of it that I've done. Um, and this allows me to choose the algorithm, the component of that algorithm, how I compare values, how I apply a gamma curve to those, how I mix them in with the accumulation buffer, uh, and how this kind of gets put into the final image. So this is the final image, and you know, this is the timer, so we're at 40 seconds into the and this is this is uh, the tails of ants uh, crawling across the um, uh, at Eden project in, in Cornwall. So basically, this is drop down has you know, a whole bunch of different uh, options. Uh, there's there's uh, squintillion combinations I can't uh, or something like that. But there's lots. Um, so. Yeah, give you an idea of the sort of really basic algorithm. Uh, and, and this is going back to the, the ones about um, the, with the photographic time lapse. So, so we're adding the light. So we're just, we're just whatever light comes in, we kind of like add it to the image. So this is some Mark Square in Venice, uh, and these are birds circling around. So the, the lightness of the bird, uh, these seagulls, uh, are overlaid on top of the darkness of the, of the concrete. Um, so it's, it's literally we're taking the lightest value, simple as that, uh, for all of the frames. And, that, and that's kind of all you need to do. If we do the opposite, this is what you can't do in film. We take the darkest mm -hmm. pixel. And this is, again, all you need to do to create these kind of trails of birds silhouetted against the, mm -hmm. the sky. You start off with a completely blue sky, this is the statue in, in the hove, uh, and the dark silhouette of the bird comes in, and every pixel you just take the darkest pixel, that's it. Of course it gets more complicated from there. Uh, what if you want to take the darkest and the lightest at the same time? Again, these are mm -hmm. circling. Uh, but again, you can, do, you can do it in code, you can't do it in, in photography. Uh, what if you feed the same video through these different algorithms. <clears throat> so this is this is taking the lightest one. This is taking something else, could be the middle one. And this is taking the dark. This was um, on uh, on the Thames uh, uh, some years ago, they had a big sort of spinny, uh, spinny light. Um, <laughs> uh, you can take the most colorful pics. So, Again, completely subjective because because you could you know what constitutes the most colourful pixel. There's lots of different albums. This is the River Cherwell in Oxford, uh, and these are these are punters going up and down the river. You can see like the like the hill, you know, the blue end on 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 the on the punt. And this mess is uh, some tourists who managed to steer their boat into the trees. <laughs> and we're having a terrible time trying to get it out again. And I was just sitting there with my camera going. <laughs> um, again, it's, it's sort of, it, yeah, it wasn't a very windy day, but I was, yeah, I was trying to get the most colorful bit. So you still get a little bit of the, um, uh, And again, so, so, you know, the variety of algorithms this is uh, Rome. These are people walking up and down the Spanish steps here. Uh, this is in the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. Uh, these are sort of shadows of people, which looks really ghostly and beautiful place if you ever go there, most photogenic place in the world. Uh, this is in Birmingham, again, sort of playing with um, parts and how, how people are, uh, are on one level and then more than another. You know, it's just a very aesthetic kind of kind of way of uh, exploring it. So, am I doing for time? Oh, I didn't time this at all. Well. 
<laughs> so I'm going to sort of uh, let me go through this bit a little quick. So this, um, so I mean, how, how many photographers have we got in the room? Oh. Yeah. And and videographers, painters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, through those that technology you use affects how you see the world. You are you are learning a way of looking at the world, of thinking about the world. And this is what I found with this technique is, is that basically when you're out into the in the world, I look at the world differently. I'm looking at motion differently. Uh, you know, this didn't come straight away. It's taking me time to appreciate what will make a good photo um, and what will you know, will work and what might work, and then, you know, whether I need to develop uh, different algorithms. Uh, and this was the thing that Clive Sinclair said. When, when I went up to him, and I was like, all, all, you know, holding it together. He was like, he just said, are you hardware or software? Very stern. And I said, well, I do, I do software, I love software. And he just said, I, I do hardware. And pretty much just turned around. <laughs> and, and I met him. <laughs> um, so, you know, this idea that, that we develop tools to uh, affect our ability to, to, to view the world and, and how we view it, um, it really changes and it's, it has a sort of profound effect. Um, so during Moybridge's time, the word instantaneous was a shorthand for authenticity and trustworthiness. And it was a synonym of from life, from nature, and of naturalism. And the idea of, of you know, does a photo capture uh, the moment? You know, it's, it's a fairly alien thing, a normal photograph, because it's, it sees the world in a way that you never can. You know, it just takes that moment of time. To me, these represent something more natural, more, more experiential, you know, not, not suggesting they do to everyone, but for me, uh, because I was there, you know, and it's and it's really bit more this sort of thinking about authenticity and how this connects to AI generated work. Um, because I, I was there, I went to all these places and I stood there with my camera and I took the photo. Some of them worked and some of them didn't, but I can look at each one and I can remember that uh, at that moment. And then the image that you're getting is a, is a kind of interpretation as a, uh, of that. So with AI, we can sort of generate images of things that we've, where we've never been, where we've never, you know, and in, obviously in some cases that's a real boon because, you know, if you want to do dragons and, you know, completely imaginary stuff, mm -hmm. then, then that's great. But what is the you know, if you're generating a picture of, of being in China, uh, yeah. but you've never been there, is that what's the authenticity of that? You know, is it important to to travel? You know, I, I did a video project called um, A Hole Cut, which was a virtual residency uh, where, during lockdown, where you know we sort of experienced the city of Kolkata in India, uh, but just uh, online. And then had to do a video about it, and it was thinking about, you know, why do we put so much focus on actually physically going to a place? Like if I step out of the plane and I put my foot on the ground, I've been there. But if you study a place for thirty years, you've never been there. You know, have I got more experience than you? Um, is it important to have physical, experiential artifacts? I, I did a project about that one as well, uh, called a mirror for remembering, which was about, you know. We can digitize objects, we can share those things. Uh, but is it important to have them in the world? Uh, this, this project, I'm referencing Moybridge and the horse, and but it's also a project that doesn't exist. It, it's an artwork that doesn't exist. It's called a, a memory of a horse or horse memory. Um, and it only exists in people's memories. Anyway, that's another, that's another project. Um, I have tried self-portrait, it's horrible, it turns out like I can't. <laughs> um, I thought, yeah, that's why that one didn't make it to the exhibition. Um, so artistically, we can always go back to first principles. We can go back to challenge our understanding and preconceptions, back to reevaluate our relationship with the technologies we use. 
We can use different tools or make our own if we want to. Artists owe nothing to big tech. We owe Apple nothing. We owe Microsoft nothing, or Adobe, or Facebook, or OpenAI. We can take technology from the gamut of human history excuse me, and make something relevant and insightful with it. It's not easy, but it can be done. And I wasn't sure I was going to fit this in, but um, I was thinking that a piece of art can create a fulcrum for someone who understands something new and profound about their place and time in the world. Um, I, I like industrial things. And um, yeah, so there's, there's, there's very abstract ones. These are, these are sort of ones that uh, just kind of show the different ways I've been exploring this uh, medium. Uh, I, I was checking the, the kind of the folder of images I've got. It's like over a thousand uh, images of, of various techniques. And, uh, it's in Heidelberg, I think. Uh, changing different colors. Um, yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. So, uh, so very quickly, the, the future of this technique. These are these are actually some images. So the images that I've taken that are on display are all pre-lockdown, uh, mm -hmm. because during lockdown there, there was very little travel, obviously. Uh, so I did take very few photos. So I wanted to sort of with this exhibition kind of draw a line under that time. But this is a uh, one that I've done recently. I've spent last year sort of getting in back into actual photography so uh you know getting in like a mirrorless camera with interchangeable lenses and just relearning all that stuff um and playing with uh you know zoom lenses and just sort of getting away from the sort of action camera uh, sort of thing so that, so i'm sort of starting a new new trains of, of um exploration with this uh, and one of the things I want to try out is, is segmentation, because at the moment, everything in the image is entirely pixel based. So it has no idea what that pixel is. So even though I'm able to do, sort of do those nice things with the seagulls and everything, it has no idea it's a seagull. It's just a, a colored pixel. So, but with segmentation, obviously, we can use uh, algorithms to say, well, that's a person, that's a car, that's a lamppost. So I want to create, uh, you can probably imagine what they'd look like, you know, sort of, uh, these sort of images, but using segmentation to create the masking for the labels. Uh, and that's it. So um, there's, there's my details. You can see more stuff from find me on social media and things. Just want to say thank you very much to Sean Hark and Paul Brown and Skip Franco for doing the interview uh, in the catalogue, and Anna for not getting too annoyed when I take my photos. <laughs> um, and for the assistance in preparing for this exhibition and the books and the, and the jazz and the BCS for hosting. And to you all for, for coming. It's been uh, very nice. Thank you. <laughs>
with any art, it conveys something to the to the viewer. You know, I've I've very much enjoyed making the image and you know experiment, and that each image marks the point that I was at at that second. But now, you know, I'm onto different things. But if it hits you, if it if it resonates with you, then you know it's it's a great image. Um, but it's that thing like when when you put art out into the world, it's, it doesn't really belong to you anymore. So it's it's yeah i just keep putting the stuff out uh, hopefully i'll get better at it. if i keep doing it for long enough okay i've got a an online question next maybe um why doesn't alex build a camera that does this at the push of a button be pie maybe and um this is from um Tim at genetic move and he said maybe <laughs> second exposures not for the full five minutes thank you Tim. um it's it's the, for the same reason that uh, people have said, "Why don't I make an app?" And it's and it's very much um, a because. Well, I mean, Raspberry Pi just don't have, have the power. I mean, I don't know about Raspberry Pi Five. Or, uh, it's it's very GPU intensive. Like on my home computer with like a twenty eighty card, it's it's like I can do real time ten eighty and about eight frames of four K a second um, enough to have it be reactive. Uh, I can't imagine <clears throat> anything like that on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and maybe on a phone, but I, I don't really want to release it. It's like it's mine. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's it's if I could get a faster graphics card at Word, you know, it's it's like it's it's not really something that I'm that I, I need to have on the camera. It's kind of like a digital dark room. I, I go out into the world my camera and I do the, the recording <laughs> and I go back to my digital dark room at home and I develop the picture. And there's something about that process, that, that um, consideration, that the fact that I can't preview it or, or have real-time feedback, that actually makes me far more focused and conscientious about what I'm taking at the time. So it's, it's a sort of, it's like echoes of the older sort of photographic process I, I missed it if you mentioned it but can you process in real time or is it uh i used to be able to technically i, I still for 1080 uh yes i could 4k now mm. uh unless i get more graphics really? cards in there as an app but um maybe yeah you yeah. don't fancy developing it um question over there how long does it take to process ten thousand images so <laughs> I got to the I got to the point with this sort of shader stuff where um, pretty much seeing it in real time for 1080 uh, for 4K it's it's as I say it's about 10 frames a second. So what I'll do is is I'll I've got always got an initial idea about what algorithm you can use, what settings, and so I'll give it a good little go. Uh, choose a range of frames. Sometimes I need to chop up the you know, top and down. Maybe the camera moves slightly when I press the button. Um, but it's it's kind of I really wanted it to be a pretty instant sort of thing or or real time thing. So I'm reliving the it, it you know it's like it doesn't just go it does the five five minutes. It's it takes about five minutes to process a five minute image. Um, but there's something about that reliving the time and again it's it's sort of it gives you enough time to reflect and maybe notice a new one maybe you know adjusting those little floating point numbers like just tiny amount you can really tweak it so it's a process you go through one setting all the way through or you stop half by inch for one image it's it's one setting but then i might generate a set of images like like with the with the spinny ride right oh, thing yeah. yeah some some clips work much better than others some will just generate like a whole series others it's a real struggle to get one good image and some things i can't get a single image you know, so I've I've got things which which all, or I thought looked great in my head, and then I try them and it just looks awful. But you know, that's the nature of you know all this stuff. Are you familiar with touch design? Yeah, but you could I think you could do that in real time. Uh, yeah. Well, Fuji Air was my my completely home written version of touch design, but for kind of my own projects. But you know, um, again, I, I I'm not interested in using other people's code base. Because it's it's I'm very big on digital preservation, uh, unless I've got the code base, then it's not it's not mine. There was a question a bit further back. Thank you. Uh, okay. uh, I know you said a lot of your travel 
and the ones in the exhibition there. I, I guess I want to know more about your process of like, what makes you think like, I want to put the camera here and film this? And like, do you kind of have a visualization of what it will look like or how does that work? Um, yes, it has developed over time. Like like when I started, I didn't know what I was doing. And it was literally, I'd go out and record a bunch of stuff. It's like, here's stuff moving. And then and then I go back home and say, okay, that worked. And, that didn't. and it, it's, and it still is a, a process of refinement and learning. You know, I think a good tool, a good tool is one that keeps giving. It doesn't just solve a, a particular thing. It just, it just, you can keep working with it and you develop alongside it. Um, and as long as it, it still interests you and it still takes you on a journey. I mean, I always like, when I see these images, some of them are so surprising, you know, and like some of the stuff I don't even notice, like there could be like birds in the background that I didn't see. Mm -hmm. And then when, when I'm developing the image and it's like, oh, this, that's the best bit. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a process of sensitization uh, of my eyes, of my temporal appreciation for a scene uh, where I'm sort of thinking kind of, oh, this, this will look great through time. And, and again, that's very different from photography. And so it's it's a it's a self-defined process that I'm working through and, uh, and like Jim would say, hopefully getting better at. It's quite nicely into an online question, which is um from Carol Sparks. Does Alex apply the basic composition rules of photography, thirds, um, leading lines, number of subjects, etc.? Um are they part of the end processing or presentation or creation? They're really about those struck rules. Are you applying rules? So position? initially, uh, as I was just saying, like, no, I was, I was literally just plopped the camera in front of, of the scene and because I didn't know quite what was going to work and because you're dealing about uh, with, with things moving potentially all the way through the scene, especially things like birds, you know, you can't predict where they're going to be. Um, so you can't be too careful. If you, if you crop in too much, if you try and align things, you might miss the wider picture. You know, you can always crop later. Uh, although I do try and do that as, as minimum as, as possible. Um, I think when I spent 20, uh, 2022 sort of relearning photography, I was getting reacquainted back with all of those compositional guides and thinking more about lighting and thinking more about um you know perspective and depth and relationships between but it's it's not very controllable only certain scenes uh like I, I like being out in the world I could set up a bit studio things I could but I've but that doesn't interest me I, I want to be in the world I want to experience the world through these through this technology so so I'm I'm looking for unexpected uh, scenes that reveal something interesting and, and you know they, they don't uh, it's, a, it's a lucky chance if they follow this photographic kind of compositional standard um, but maybe I can get better and I can, <laughs> can work it in a bit so it's a 20 year project another question over there yeah. I'm just fascinated by your relationship with your the tool and the output. And I was wondering if you could just expand on that a little bit more. It, sound, it seemed to me from what you were just saying that you were developing the tool and what happened as an output sometimes was like serendipitous, you know, and that was really cool. R rather than chasing a particular effect and doing a tool that actually like does something specific. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you, how do you see that? And how do you see that? Um, how does that work with you? Uh, it is so. So part of, part of this, and I did mention it was the the way computers store information. Like, like you know, because we we are experiencing through our eyes, and through our eyes. You know, we we don't have a lot of control about um, how this data is is encoded. It's not physiological difference. You know, you, you have a slightly different view. You might even be a tetrachromat. Mm -hmm. That's like why I yeah, yeah. I've got my own spectrum responses. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. like like uh, it's, yeah. it's something like one in four females has a extra uh, model cone, so you can see more colours. Um, 
so it's but so it's it's the ability to play about with that flow of information and whereas a color space like the ones that I showed we designed technically to respond to technical issues you know about color reproduction uh in in you know if you're doing lots of compositing and lots of work and color correction and color grading if you don't have you know 10 bit images and all this stuff the whole thing just falls apart so these, these are technical solutions but they have aesthetic improvements you know uh, uh side effects and possibilities and so the some of the, some of the images that I've shown, you know, they've been, you probably noticed, you know, very pixelated, very like harsh color differences. And, you know, they sort of really picked out um, color bands in the sky because the, you know, it's only eight bit source, you know, videos. And so it's it's accepting and working with those, and making it, making it apparent, uh, those side effects and those, those abilities of those algorithms. So I'm not, you know, I didn't want to blow everyone and go, well, the YUV 12 color space obviously is, uh, you know, very interesting for these 18 reasons. But it's it sort of becomes inherent in the, the image or it's, it's become an, an aesthetic exploration into. Do you discover properties of this space? Yeah. And it's like, what you know, what does this do to this, this particular source video? What does it do to the sky? What does it do to... To the ground or the sunset or the you know so it's a really it's like using a different paint or a different uh, canvas or you know you remind me of the old masters is saying like you know have their own pigment recipes it is, yeah it is like, yes i just know yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah i need a bit more of that yeah, yeah. Why should i use photoshop <laughs> yeah. you, you guys have got photoshop right yeah. yes would you rule out some shots from a drone um i have a drone and I did try it, and even on a still day, the drone moves too much. Like like when I'm doing these shots, like the camera's locked and it's on a tripod, and and sometimes weighed down, and it's just like it cannot move because as soon as the camera moves even a tiny bit, it smears the whole the whole image. You might be able to get some software one day to compensate for that. Yeah. Yes, but, uh, <laughs> but again, it's it's like it's like the, our eyes would not. I mean, like, like, like this camera. I've got like it's got a little gimbal on it and stuff. And to my eyes, it doesn't move. You feed it through the algorithm, and it'll do sub pixel movement, and it'll pick it out, and the whole thing goes blurry. So I've thought about flying a drone and landing it on top of a building. Oh yeah, and doing it that way. Yeah, but I'm too terrified of losing my <laughs> <laughs> Like, like the battery runs out, and then I'm just like, you know, how do I get? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's a tool that, that is interesting. Perhaps one more question, if there is. Yep. To what extent do you analyze the video data in order to inform what properties might be interesting to play with and what settings might be interesting settings? Do you do that at all, or is it more just an aesthetic judgment? No, the, 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 I have a, again, I, I, I'll never get these months of my life back where I you really got into video compression and color spaces and, and, I'm no expert, but I, but I I went in and I tried to learn as much as I could about you know, um, the basic principles and why this you know MP4 or H.264 is different than H.265 or you know stuff like that. So more so I could understand um, how much data I could expect to get from videos. So you know, for instance, on on the GoPro, it's like eight bit. You know, video can, but on the DJI one I've got is now 10 bit, you know, color, and I can do D log, and I can, you know, so I can work with different, uh, you know, it's more dynamic range, you know, so so, there, so there's uh, choices with that 